So, um, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for, for joining. Thanks for sharing a little bit of your time with us. Um, today, I'm just going to give you a brief introduction to Pandas, um, which I hope will kind of empower you to ask more questions faster. So, to get started, um, I'm going to go through just the intended lecture goals. So I want you guys to leave with a solid understanding of the pandas data frame anatomy. We're going to go through that here in a moment. Um, I also want you to know how to fail well and, and better understand what that means. Um, so really come away with terms that will help you Google your way to solutions rather than stumbling along the way. Additionally, leave feeling empowered to ask more answerable questions, no matter your interests. So before we even start, let's start with a practical example. So first, we've got to come up with a question. We go to the University of Alabama, of course, it's about football. So the question is, what is the average point spread of college football games by conference so far this season? So to start, the point spread is defined as team one score minus team two score, and you take the absolute value between those two things. So, of course, we gotta find a data set to get started. So, as we typically do, we Google college football data sets, Reddit. Um, Reddit's a great place to go and, and find stuff quickly. And look at this, first link, college football statistics. Fantastic. First comment, there's a whole subreddit devoted to college football analysis. This is, this is great. Well, even easier. Now we got 2020 edition with data and resources. We scroll down a little bit, all right, NCAA, whatever, shameless plug for a comprehensive free source of college football data. This sounds like exactly what we want. And in less than 10 clicks, we found an awesome site that can get us data that we can start playing with. So if we head up to data, um, we want to get games and results, and we want it for the, the 2020 season. So great, this is, this is comprehensive. This is a huge data set. Let's, let's go ahead and download it. Um, it's going to download it as a CSV file, um, and what we'll do is we'll actually jump over to Google Colab um, which you guys will become more familiar with and pick up quickly um, as we go through this presentation. Um, and we'll just start using pandas here. Um, so I, I don't know if Dr. Cohen has introduced you all to, um, to Jupyter Notebooks this semester, um, but if so, um, Google Colab is a way, is a, is a Jupyter Notebook running on Google server somewhere. You can save Jupyter Notebooks into your Google Drive and, and do data analysis without ever having to install Python locally. It's awesome. Um, and what's even more awesome is that it comes pre-packaged with libraries like Pandas and NumPy and some others that we're gonna use later today. So you don't ever have to install um, some of these really commonly used um, library. So we'll, we'll go over how to import pandas later. Um, you can also upload files um, in Google Colab, and that's exactly what we're going to do. We're just going to upload our data. We are going to quickly just have a look at it um, and see this is this is really comprehensive. We've got tons of rows. Um, and th this should look kind of familiar. We talked about team one's points and team two's points. Well, you could say the home points and the away points. Those are, you know, the away points and the, and the home points. Um, and we're going to use NumPy's absolute value function here and just take the difference, the absolute difference between these two columns and create a new column called point spread. Let's check it out. Bam, we already got it. That easy, it's in our data frame and we can move to the next thing. So one of the things that we, in our question, we wanted to see 
the point spread by conference. So I, I don't think it's really fair to compare non-conference games. So if an SEC team is to play a non-SEC team or you know something like that. So we're quickly gonna filter out and just get um, conference games. So we can just say conference games, which was a, a row in or a column in our data frame and just say, you know, if, if it is a, um, if it is a conference game, just give me those. Um, the next thing that we'll do is we are, we're going to group these results by the, the home conference, because we know that since we, we filtered out the, um, conference games, the home conference and the away conference have to be the same thing. So we can effectively group these things together, take our point spread column that we made just a few minutes ago by taking the absolute difference, and then get a, a mean between these things. So in the first five minutes of this presentation, we found a data set, we've broken it down, we've added a new column to it, we've you know, calculated some statistics, and now the, the icing on top of the cake, we make a plot using the mean, and you could right click, you could throw this into a message, and you know, put this with, send this to your friends, send it to your family, whatever. If you're a nerd like myself, of course I'm gonna do that, and I hope that I convince you that using pandas um, by the end of this presentation that you guys can do this kind of stuff as well. And it's really empowering and awesome. So um, let's jump back over to the presentation and I am going to give me one second. All right. Austin, are you going to uh, just go back and, and just cover the basic syntax? Yes. Yeah. So okay. we, um, you, you are. Oh, okay. Never mind. My, my presentation. You got it figured out. Um, so uh, before we before we go into the syntax, I think it's really important to understand what the data frame is um, and the components that it has, and compare those to things that we use all the time, like spreadsheets or like tables in a shape file. Um, but before we even get to that point, we're gonna just, just to give you some context about Pandas. Um, so this is pulled from the Pandas website. Pandas is a fast, powerful, flexible, and easy to use open source data analysis and manipulation tool built on top of Python, uh, on top of the Python programming language. Um, it's a, it uses a wide variety, or it's used in a, in a wide variety of settings and academia in the commercial domain, including finance, neuroscience, um, economics, statistics, advertising, web analytics, and of course, geography. This is my, me inserting my opinion, but quickly Pandas is growing to be the equivalent to what Excel used to be on a resume. Um, for you undergrads out there, this is gonna be a fantastic way to set yourself apart from the pack if you can use Pandas. Um, and, and lastly, if you've ever heard of, of NumPy, which we saw briefly in the example a few seconds ago, um, Pandas uses NumPy all over the place under the hood. Um, each column, as we'll see later, in the data frame is stored as a NumPy array. So jargon alert, an array is like a list, but can only hold one type of data. So I'm sure you guys have, Dr. Cohen's taught you about lists and they're, how wonderful they are. Think exactly like a list, but you can only store one kind of data in there. So let's move on. The data frame anatomy. So before we even look at a data frame itself, I think it's really helpful to try to draw some similarities between something that is very familiar like a, a spreadsheet of personal finances. So we're all familiar with the, the column and row format that is inherent to Excel. Um, there's also on the side this index that, um, that we get 
in Excel. They kind of distinguish rows from one another. Let's see that exact same thing in pandas. So, right, it, it looks similar, but let's, let's really tease out what that looked like in Excel and what it looks like in pandas. So just like in Excel, the data frames are made up of rows and columns. In both um, Excel and pandas, um, Columns in both Excel and Pandas are typically used to group a certain kind of data. For example, the date column in both examples holds a date for each record. Simple. A row can, uh, can be thought of as a record and each column in the record gives us information on the record like the description or the number or, or the account number or the date. We'll also notice that there's an index here in Pandas, and we'll elaborate more on this in the future, but I really just wanted to show you quickly how similar something that's very, uh, very well known to you all, just, just show you that Pandas is, is very similar to that. So we'll come back to that in a second, but let's take a brief detour and talk about some terminology. Um, so, each column in a data frame is a pandas series. Um, and, and why is this important? It's really just important um, for, to know what is a definition, to know what to look for when you run into a problem. Um, so each column in a data frame is a pandas series. Um, a pandas series is just a one dimensional list with an index. Um, so just think of a single column in an Excel spreadsheet and a data frame is a collection of series stacked next to one another. It's pretty neat, right? So each series in a data frame share a common index. So that index being those ascending numbers on the far left. Um, so you can think of those as the things that are binding together each, uh, each one of these series. Um, and, and this is important as we move forward. Another way that we could think about this instead of rows and columns is we could think about this as there being an X axis and a Y axis. Um, so if you wanted to tell me the location of coffee, you could say that it's in row three in the column category, or you could say it's in row three, column C. Hmm. Column C, in a way, you can think of columns themselves as having some kind of index, right? We've looked at the index on the side, those ascending numbers, but then there's also kind of these other descriptors for columns. Um, let, let's take a look at what that looks like in Pandas. So Pandas doesn't show us the column index. Um, but it's there. It's really helpful to think of columns names as if they were in a list. So for example, date is in the zeroth column index. Pandas also does this with the Y axis too. Let me change the Y axis, or let me change the index values to something other than numbers uh, to make this clear. So pandas also allows us to change the index values, as you can see, to something other than a number. This is really handy when it comes to dealing with time series um, and, and other applications, but really time series is the, is the main thing that, that it's used for. So I've also put the index, um, the index's index, if you will, or the location of it, um, kind of like if it were in a list, just to make it clear what's going on behind the scenes. Again, it's helpful to think of the columns and index as lists. This concept will come up later when I show you how to get things out of a data frame. But anyways, back to coffee. There are two ways that we could describe the location of coffee in the data frame. You could say that it is in row B, in the column 
category. Or you could say that it's in row one, column two, right? Does that make sense how we can describe these things as using their you know, literal names or their locations? Um, and this is something that's gonna come up a lot. So while we're talking about describing the location of data in a data frame, it's crucial to remember we always specify the row, then the column. You could also think about this as specifying the y-axis, then the x-axis, or for us GY folks, the lat, then the long. Um, some operations in pandas can operate over the rows or the columns. For example, if we were to take the sum, you can specify if you want a sum across all items in a column, that would be axis zero, or you could take the sum across all items in a row, that would be axis one. I think it's really helpful to think of the rows and columns as, as a y and x axis for this purpose. So rows or the y axis is considered the zero axis and columns or the X axis are considered the one axis. I think if you put them in the list notation like I have up in the top left hand corner, this becomes really clear why there's a zero and a one because if we were to put a row and a column next to each other in a list, that would be their index values um, or their indices. So, this has been just a brief introduction to the anatomy of a data frame, but I hope that this leaves you feeling more comfortable with the data, uh, with the data structure itself. Um, and it's given you kind of some, uh, some similarities to things that you're very comfortable with um, and will help you get past some of the syntax later because you're comfortable with the data structure itself. So um, let's move on to something more fun. How do we import pandas? So canonically, when we import pandas, we call it PD. So when we import it, um, you can reference it using the two letters PD. It's also common to import NumPy when we do this because it's used so much underneath the hood. And, um, and a lot of times you'll use NumPy functions interchangeably with pandas. Um, so, Right, you told me about the data structure, the data frame, Austin, but how do I get things into it? So it's really easy to get things into a data frame and that's what's so awesome. We already saw in the example before using um, the read CSV, um, but there's also, um, you can read in Excel files or read in um, HTML or JSON or uh, there's, a ton of different um, formats that you can just read in a file and create a data frame. So likewise, if you want to save a data frame to a file, um, we could use to CSV. So instead, you use the data frame object um, instead. So notice that on the left, we said pd.reads or underscore read CSV. Um, and then on the right, we're using the, the data frame object um, and we're saying save that to underscore CSV. So it's really important to note that you can write a data frame to formats supported by pandas. It doesn't matter how you created the data frame. So for example, if you created a data frame from a CSV, you can also save it to Excel. Um, so if you need to transfer data from different formats easily, pandas can, can really save you a lot of time as well. So another way to get things into a data frame is by passing in, um, passing in a dictionary um, where the, the keys, so in this example, A and B, which they'll become the data frame column names, um, the values of those keys, which are, are listed in this example, will be the column row values. Um, we will 
we'll see this in in some examples for the most part i've stuck to just getting data um, using the the methods that i showed in the slide before but it's really helpful to know if you just wanted to create data yourself you could also do this so um, before we jump over to Google Colab, I'll, I'll pause for a minute and ask Dr. Cohen if there are any, any questions that have come up on the chat or if anyone has any questions. Any questions? So we're gonna, he's gonna dive into the syntax. Uh, so, and uh, can you also explain a little bit more about uh, Google Colab? So yeah. they, know, they know how to get to it and how to use it, just the basic, few basic stuff. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I will jump out of that. So if you want to, um, or before I even say, you know, how to get to a Google Colab notebook, um, Google Colab is, um, these are, are Jupyter notebooks. Um, which, Dr. Cohen, have you used those in, in this course? Uh, I think you might be muted if you're answering. Uh, no, no, we, we have, I, I showed them very briefly the, the ArcGIS Pro notebooks, but we haven't, we have not used them. Okay, so um, that is what, what Dr. Cohen has shown you before. I mean, maybe you haven't gotten a hands-on experience with it. Um, a, a, a notebook is a way to integrate code, these little blocks, as well as, as rich text. So you can, you can really start to build out content. And I wish I could. Um, nice. So I can, I can make these sections. I can have, um, you know, actual just sentences and descriptions and whatnot um, with code, which is really nice if you're trying to explain how you wanna um, how you wanna do something, why you did something that way. As you can see, I've embedded some links to different data sources that we're gonna use along the way. It's a way to let code and descriptions live interchangeably. Now, the great thing about Google Colab is um, I guess before before I say that at all, if you just you know, Google Colab, then if you click on Google Colab, you get brought up with this dialog and you can just say, I want a new notebook or you can select a notebook that you already have here. And you'll be brought up with something that looks very similar to what I just showed a second ago. So in here you could say, in, import pandas as pd and you can start going um the what i just did to get a new um to get a new cell you can run each one of these cells um by if you hold down shift and hit enter it will run the code that's in this cell um, and then by default, if you're at the bottom, it'll give you a new cell. Um, but this is, it, it's great because you can, you can also share these things. So um, I will, at the end of this presentation, you guys will have access to this whole content that I have put together for you guys. And you'll always have access to it. It's, it's yours to keep and to, uh, you could make a copy of it and add some stuff, add your own notes to it. And it's a great way to, um, to you know, bookmark things, things that you're not gonna remember along the way. Um, I, I really like Google Colab and I, yeah, I, I think it's a really nice way to use, use Python without ever having to, to download it. Um, you just use it in your browser. So, to move forward, um, before we get into data frames, I know that's becoming my, my catchphrase for today, before we get into this, um, I think it's helpful to know how to get help um, because a lot of times, um, number one, we, always don't, we don't always know what question we wanna ask. So like, 
I, I know something about pandas, but how do I do this with it? I hope that the, the, the first section of this PowerPoint presentation um, was angled at giving you kind of the definitions of the data frame so then you'll be better able to ask Google when you run into a, um, when you run into a block. Well, I also want to give you the tools to be able to ask Python um, you know, to be able to help you out as well. So if, I don't know if you guys have run across it before, but Python has a built-in help function. Um, and so for example, if you wanted to get help about the pandas data frame, you could just say help and then pass in pd.dataframe. Um, this is free help. Um, you don't need the internet to, to use it if you have pandas installed. Um, so that, that's great. Um, and what, what's really great is, yes, there's a lot of crazy information packed in here. There's a lot of technical jargon. Um, so, right, we're not always interested in all of this stuff. Some people will be, but if you scroll down to the very bottom, um, usually you're going to find something, you're going to find examples. So, right, this is how you use this function. This one is maybe not the best example. There's usually multiple examples, but it's just a really easy way to quickly, if you know what function you're using, instead of Googling for it, you can quickly just ask for help. Um, another way to access um, that information is in Google Colab, if we say PD read CSV, as soon as we open the, uh, the parentheses, it's gonna pull up this exact same help page that we just looked at, except now it looks prettier. And you can scroll all the way down to the bottom, just like we did before, same exact example. This can be really helpful when you don't know all the arguments that a function takes in. Um, so for example, I think in a previous assignment in this class, Dr. Cohen had you read in um, a tab separated values. Um, you could, you know, maybe peruse through the, uh, the arguments here and you'll see, oh, separator. Well, you could just change the separator from a comma to um, a pipe for a, a, I guess you could do backslash T, sorry. Um, and now this, now this reads in tab separated value um, files. So just a really great way to quickly get help. So enough boring things about getting help and about data frames and whatnot. Austin, just give me the goods. Let's, let's do some analysis. Let's get our hands dirty. So um, for this example, I just went out and grabbed some some Census Bureau data. Um, this is just the annual county and resident population estimates for selected age groups and sex from April 1st, 2010 to July 1st, 2019. Um, I, I linked the data source here. We're not gonna go check it out now, um, but feel free to go check it out afterwards. So this is, this is weird, Austin. This, is, this looks like a, a URL. Well, because it is a URL, um, this is this is what's really awesome about pandas. One of the many things that's really awesome about pandas is you don't actually have to download the data locally. You could just pass in a, a URL for most things. So if there's an Excel that's on online, um, or if there's a CSV that's online, you can just pass that in and it's going to load it. So this this info. Um, function is going to just give us a breakdown of what we just loaded. Um, so it's, it's going to tell us information about the, the data frame itself. So you'll see, all right, there's the column. These are the column names um, and then their data types. So you'll see most of these are integers. Um, if you see object, um, object is a string field in pandas. Um, and yeah, it's just a really great way to see, wow, we have way too much data. Why did you give us this many files or this many, um, this much information, Austin? Let's, let's break it down. Austin, Another uh, way to look at the, um, Austin, can you hear me? Yes. So the new cask, if you can, um, 
uh, paste the uh, the the link to the um, to the lab to the notebook so they can work on it while yeah. you so if you'll head over to um, just our Twitter page so it's at sdml.ua you don't need an account for this you can click on it right here and and start having fun and going along with me thanks uh, no actually what I need is the data set that you're working with this this one yes the link to it if you can throw it oh, okay all right so it's it's linked if you click this link right here then you'll be able to check it out it was just data that i i, I hope is is interesting enough for people like ourselves that are in water that do a lot of water research but also you know geography super diverse what's something that can kind of be interesting to all of us so that, that was my, my goal at using census stuff. Um, so, other, you have any other questions, Sunak? Nope. Cool. All right. So, as you can see, I gave you a ton of data. Um, another, uh, we, can, we can query the data frame for its shape. The shape is a property of the data frame. And what this is going to say is, you know, how many rows it has, right? We remember that from the presentation, rows then columns. So there's 814 rows and 96 columns. That's a ton of data. We definitely don't need that much for this, um, for this presentation. So we're going to break it down here in a second. Another really helpful command to use um, once you have your data frame loaded is head. Um, and head is just going to return you the first five rows in your data frame. This is great to just quickly look at your data um, and just get a sense of what it looks like after loading it in. So, um, like I said before, 96 columns, we don't need all that data. Um, how do we subset? How do we get out a portion of the data um, from our data frame? So don't, don't focus too much up on this syntax right now. It's going to come to you as we, we're going to do a ton of examples like this along the way. Um, but what we're doing is we're just passing in, these are column names. You can see years here, the county name here, um, the population estimate, and then we're going to get the population estimate for, for males and for females. Um, and We'll just set it back to the same variable name. So now, now we have a subset of the original data that we that we loaded into pandas. And again, we'll use head just to take a quick look at what it looks like. So if we wanted to just extract a, a singular column from our data frame, um, which since we know that data frames are made up of each column is a is a series. Um, if we want to just get a panda series back, we can just use, this is, this is very similar to what you would do to get back a, an item from a dictionary. So that, that's, that's how I like to explain it, at least, um, is you just put in the, the column name and you grab out your data. And you'll see this is the exact same thing as, as these right here. Um, so... Moreover, to extract field, a field or a group of columns, we use the square bracket notation. To extract multiple columns, you pass a list of column names. So in this example, the column names would be, I like these columns, each of them being a singular column themselves, um, to extract multiple columns. And then we wanna, when we want to extract a single column, the resulting type is a panda series. So we can check that out just to see, check our knowledge and see if this truly is a series by just putting that in, in type to check what type it is. And we see, yeah, it's a series. Neat. So next, now that you know how to get some data out of data frames, we're gonna cover more methods of how to get more 
uh, get data out differently later. But what about filtering your data frame? What if you're just interested in, in a portion of the data that you have? So let's, let's subset our, our data frame to just get um, results where the county name is Tuscaloosa County. So as you notice here, there is, we have the, the data frame, and this is just the exact same. Um, it, it looks like when we extracted a column, um, and that, that's what you're doing. You're saying, give me this column, um, and then you're gonna ask a question. So it's gonna ask a question at every single row in, in this column. It's gonna say, are you equal to Tuscaloosa County? And if it's not equal to Tuscaloosa County, then it's not going to give it back to you. Um, so let's, let's see that. Cool. We got Tuscaloosa County. Um, so just to, just to be more um, explicit about this and hopefully help you kind of get a better grasp of what is happening, because rightfully so, this looks a little funky. Um, when we, when we, you know, just run this, this portion of the code that was inside of the square brackets. All you're doing is you're getting back a, a conditional, um, you can think of this like a conditional list where if that row was equal to Tuscaloosa County, then it's gonna say true. Since almost most of the data in there did not equal Tuscaloosa County, all of these are saying false but I hope that gives you a better understanding and intuition for what's going on um, behind the scenes. Austin, can I stop you just for a second? Yeah. Uh, so think about your last assignment, right? And you have to filter out for the zeros. It's one command line in Pandas. That's it. You don't need a loop. You don't need if statements. That's it. So th that's why I really was excited when Austin proposed to give this class because Panda is so much more efficient in dealing with those data sets. Go on, Austin. Yeah, for sure. No, yeah. thanks for stopping me. So to build off of what Dr. Cohen was just mentioning about your last assignment, let's say that instead of just columns with zeros, um, you also wanted to apply more than one conditional. So in, in the, the data frame that we've been working with, this little subset here, um, we have both the male population estimates and the female population estimates. So let's ask another question. Um, I want pandas to, to give me back records where the female population estimate is above 100,000 and the male population estimate is less than 100,000. So if, if we remember what it, applying just one conditional to the data frame, look like it would be just passing in in this however if we want to add more than one conditional we can we can put this 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 conjunction here an and and say we want to get the this conditional and this conditional so both of these would have to be true when they're compared against the row um, to to give you back that part of the data. Um, so let's see that in action. And I think the description here will make that more clear. So we can use the, the ampersand, the and, or the pipe, the or operators when specifying two or more conditions. This lets us chain together logic. Notice that the conditional statements are in parentheses right up here. When using more than one conditional, you must put each conditional in its own set of parentheses, and then you join them by a conjunction, just like we do in English, an and or an or. Um, so that, that's just a way to quickly filter out using multiple, um, multiple uh, conditionals. So what about if we are interested in um, we just want to get back the year that is this one and this one, right? We learned that you could say Tuscaloosa data frame at year equals equals one and then do a little ampersand and then do the exact same thing equals three. And that could get messy when you start asking more questions, when you want to get you know, more 
uh, more specific about what you want to get back. So pandas has a really nice way of um, of getting around that by using this is in um, function. And all it's going to say, it's, it's asking the question on every single row in, in the year column, are you in this list here? So if you are a one or if you are a three, we want to get that back. Um, and that's exactly what it's going to do. So what if we, in our, in our question that we ask, we just wanted the population estimates. We don't want the other fields because if we ran this, we would get all of the other fields in our data frame. Um, we just want to get back the population estimates column or as we're learning to call it a series. So we can, we can run um, this command here, which would give us back the whole data frame. But then we can just say from that result, just give me back the population estimate column. So let's check that out. Um, if you notice, this is the exact same as what's inside of the print statement. And here I just grabbed out the population estimate column. Does that make sense? Cool. So again, we can use is in and pass a list of items to get back rows containing the values that was in that list, um, if they're there, of course. So let's move on to a different way to get back, um, get back data from a data frame. Um, so we're still going to be extracting portions of the data frame. But the reason that I harped so much on what the data frame looked like is for this upcoming section and to understand the, the anatomy, if you will, of the data frame. So let's, let's get back the years that are equal to one um, from the data frame, just like we kind of did with coffee um, in the slideshow. And we just want and we're going to do this specifying the row and the column. So if we look here, the row is, um, the row index is 744, and then we want to get the column year. Um, so using this dot lock, you can specify the, the row index name and the column index name. So if we do that, we get back just this value. So this is just like we did with coffee in, that, um, in the PowerPoint. And this is just a different way of getting out data. So if you remember back to, to slicing, um, slicing a string, um, you can also do the same thing with dot lock. So let's say that we wanted to get row values in between um, 744 and 748. We could do that using lock. Um, if, you, if you pick up on this, um, the dot lock is similar to um, what we were doing before to subset a data frame, but instead of, speci of specifying the columns, um, we specify the rows here. Um, but we can also specify the row, then the column. So this is the dot lock is, is a more flexible way to subset your data frame. Um, and, and we'll see it a lot as we move forward. So just like we did with getting out a subset of the columns by name, we could also pass in a list of row indices as, as a list. So, right, we want this row and we want this row. So let's see that again. This is similar to is in, um, but it's also extremely similar to just subsetting and getting back a subset of columns by passing in a list. So I hope all these things are starting to look similar. Um, and, and yeah. So to, to continue, um, in the presentation, I harped about the indexes index and the columns index. And I, I probably thoroughly confused you in doing that. In writing up that presentation, I definitely confused myself. The index is index, really, Austin? There should be a better word for that. Um, but the reason I wanted to specify that is exactly for this last example up here. Um, when you use lock, 
um, and you look at this data frame, this is this also has an index. This would be the zero index. This would be the one index for the rows all the way up to zero, one, two, three, four, just like with the, the county names, this would be zero column, year would be the first column, right, on and on and on. So you can imagine that there's kind of a list indices kind of over to the side and up above. I think that's really helpful to visualize. And if we use the iLock command, the index location command, we can, we can instead subset based on the index instead of the actual name of the, of the row or the column. So in this example, we wanted to get back this row since it's, it's the zeroth one, it's the first one. So that's exactly what we got back. You can also use iLock um, exactly the same as we did with dot lock if we want to get back a row and a column. So in, in this next um, portion of code, we want to get back the, the, the zeroth row and the first column. So the, the zeroth row and the first column. So let, let's check it out. That's exactly what we did. Um, I, I think it's, Pandas makes it kind of difficult to, to understand what's going on behind the scenes since every time you load a data frame, it's gonna give you an ascending index on the side for the rows. But hopefully you guys have a really good understanding that, hey, there's, there's more information hidden behind these numbers here. There are actual, you know, the location of the row has an index value. Um, so, Austin, what will happen if you um, don't have iLock there, just zero and one? Um, and just like did like this? Yeah. You cannot, um, so in Pandas, right. we can't specify a, when you use the square bracket notation without using iLock or lock, um, it's only looking for two things. Um, the first, it's looking for a column name or a list of column names like we did before to subset the data frame. So if we just wanted to get out the county name and year, we would pass in a list of county name and year. Um, or like we showed before with filtering, you can pass in a, a conditional. So when you pass in that conditional, um, you're really passing in a a really long list of Booleans. So is this row, is it true or is it false? Um, if you want to actually get at the rows and columns, you have to use iLock or lock. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Austin, I have a question on that. Uh, why is it returning the other columns? Because we specify zero and one, that's zero index first column. Shouldn't it be only returning um, just the one value? I don't understand that. No, that's a really good point. And I, I did not mention that I printed this out up here. Um, and in preparing it, I was going to, to print out the data frame and then you know say this is the zeroth column and the first, or the zeroth row and the first column. Um, but I, I had scrolled up and done that. So that's a really good point. If we comment that out, yeah, we're just getting back. Okay. That's a really Thank good catch to know. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So as we, as we talked about before, or as I showed with uh, dot lock before, you can also pass in a slice in a, a slice of rows or a slice of um, of column indices into iLock. Um, I, I linked. You can go here. There's a great resource for for learning more about slicing and getting more into lock and iLock. And there's a bunch of really good examples in this, in what I've linked. Um, but I wanna move on. We got a lot more stuff to cover in this class period. Um, so maybe check that out after class or, or when you have some time. So in this next code block, um, we're going to create a data frame from a dictionary. And then we're gonna change a value that we that we set. Um, so what does that mean? 
we are going to make this data frame. As we saw in the presentation, you can pass in a dictionary and this is going to be the column name. This will be a column name as well. And then inside of here, we can pass in a range, um, a range generator, or in, in B, what I've done is I passed in a range, which you can notice is one smaller than this one. And then I've just added a, added to the bottom of it, um, none. Because I want to show you how Pandas deals with, with none. Um, and, and just to also show you that we don't have to use um, the, the index that pandas automatically assigns the ascending values on the side. I just specify the, the index to be um, A through E. So we'll see, this is what our data frame looks like. Notice down here in um, column B, row E, we see NAN. Um, if, you, if you've used NumPy, this is something that or originates from NumPy. It's called not a number. Um, and anytime you throw a none value or a value that doesn't exist into pandas, um, it's gonna store it as, as a NAN. Um, and that, that's just really helpful to know. So if we wanna change the value of, of no data um, or of NAN here, we could say, let's, let's get our data frame dot lock the row E at column B, set that equal to 12. Um, equivalent, you could have said with I lock the fourth row, remember we're weird and we start counting at zero, um, and then the first column, so column B, those would be the exact same thing. So let's check that out in, in real time. So great, we now have a We've now changed that to something that's you know, more meaningful. It's no longer a, a no data value. So um, before I start on the next section, you guys have any questions um, just before we get started? Now I'm here. Sweet. Um, also, just to preface this before we, we go into the next section, I wholeheartedly understand that this is a ton of content. We're talking about a huge package here. Um, this this CoLab notebook um, and the, the resources that I'm sharing at the very bottom of this are meant to be used outside of class as, you know, I want to do this with pandas and I forgot how to do this with pandas. I forget how to use pandas all the time. Um, it's learning how to fail and learning how to quickly find solutions is, is how, to, how to code. Um, and, and we're all here to empathize and do that together. So use, use this CoLab notebook, um, use the other resources because I, I know for sure I wouldn't soak up but 12% of this class if I were taking it. So back to content, let's say we wanted to create a new column derived from existing columns. So in, in this example, um, we're gonna take our Tuscaloosa data frame, which you remember we subsetted from our big census data frame and we left the, the population estimate for females and the, the overall population estimate. So we could just divide those um, and create a new column. This is how you make a new column based on existing uh, information that you have. So you'll see, all right, now we have these, these percentages here. Fantastic, that's really great. Still, we have, we have these years that don't really make any sense. Um, so let's try to make some sense of them. I went out and I grabbed the metadata um, for this data set. Just to, just to put more sense to what this one through 12 actually means. Um, so the year is as follows. The first two years, this is the total population for the, the 2010 census um, broken up by county. The second one is some population estimate base. I didn't look into exactly you know, how they came up with that or what the methodology is behind it, but that's the description. And all of these columns after here are the actual population estimates broken down by year. So you'll see right there, the population estimate 
um, to the the first um, to the first day. So let's say, or let, let's go back and and fix the years to be something more meaningful. Now that we've 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 looked through our metadata, we know what the actual mean. Let's go change their meaning to mean something to us. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to make a new data frame um, based off of a subset of an existing data frame. And what we're going to ask the data frame, we're going to ask it a question. We're going to say, give me back rows where the year is greater than or equal to three, right? So that would be all of these inside of here. And then we're going to take that new data frame and we're going to say at the year column, um, subtract off three. Um, since, right, this, this should be 2010. Um, now let's just add 2010 back to it. So this is going to be, a, this is going to allow us to, to make the years, you know, actually be years. You know, obviously you could have done this and said 2007 and said, but the, one of the really important things about pandas and Python in general is make things intuitive write things that people can come back and read this um, and, and understand what you're trying to do. So, right, we have our years as we would like them to be. That's great. Uh, Austin, let me just a minute, I want to, so uh, again, going back to the power of this, uh, think about a list, again, that you've all used and doing some mathematical operation of them. One of the big advantage of NumPy and Pandas is th these kind of things that you can do mathematical operations or, or filtering or whatever, but just in one line, it automatic or not automatically, but it knows to do it to all the values in a specific column, right? Instead of needing to loop through it with a, you know, one or two uh, for loops. So that is super, super convenient to manage in your data set. Yeah, go on, Austin. No, no, thanks for thanks for interjecting. Feel free to, as we continue. So so far, we've we've manipulated a lot of numbers. We've made percentages. We've changed our years to something more meaningful. Well, a lot of our data is strings. What if we want to, you know, change those as well? Pandas also lets us operate on strings. Um, it's a little bit more, um, or maybe not as intuitive as the numbers, but I know you guys got it. So um, what we're gonna do here, let's focus on everything on the right hand side of this equal sign. So what we're saying is from our Tuscaloosa estimate data frame, right, get our county names, panda series, or column if you'd like to call it that. And this dot str function is, um, it, it lets you operate on the thing on this, this series as if it were a string, because it really is. So this lets you do anything that you could typically do to a string on a, on just a, a regular, uh, or on every single row in a data set, uh, or in a series, sorry. I am, it's been a long day, I'm sticking in there. So in this example, we're going to, um, we're gonna replace anywhere in the row where there is the word county with the empty string. So it's kind of redundant. Every single county name has county next to it. Um, so let's get rid of that. And as, as you notice, we can, we can actually set um, a result that we get back from a computation back to the same column. We don't have to specify a different column um, or a different series, if you will, you can store it back in the exact same place, which is really convenient. So does, does that make sense? I know I kind of bundled my words there for a second, um, but I hope that that makes some sense. Um, also, another way to do this, instead of using the, just the, the typical square bracket notation would be to use lock. And this is definitely some place that I myself has stumbled and a lot of people stumble is this notation looks really funky. So dot lock and then there is a, a, a colon there and then comma and year. So since we know that dot lock 
um, by default just operates on the rows, but then you can also say, you know, give me a row and a column. What we're saying um, here with the colon is give me all of the rows. Um, this, is, this comes from slicing a string, if you remember that, um, or a list. You could just say, um, just for fun, let's say, String. I'm becoming you, Dr. Cohen. I'm calling things strings. This is this is not this isn't good. Um, so we could say say this, and right, it's going to give you everything from from the beginning until the end. So just to just to show you, that's that's what this this is doing. That's definitely something that that I've stumbled at, and I'm sure. Just, just come back and, and try to jog your memory later. But I did want to show you the syntax. So we're just, in this case, we're just going to look at, at year, um, all the rows in the column year. Um, and we want, to, we want to change the type of year to a string. So um, if you remember, um, if you wanted to, in previous assignments, you've done like float, um, in parentheses around, you know, a uh, an integer if you needed to do that, or a string cast a, a an integer to a string um, when you need to, you know, append it to a file or whatever. Um, Pandas makes it really, really easy to just say, you know what, I want this as this type, and we just pass in string. We could have done, you know, I could have put in float there as well. Right now they're stored as integers, so just to check our check our knowledge we'll again come back to the info function that lets us um, you know quickly get a glance at the columns and their data types we'll see now that year is an object and like i mentioned before and i would have forgotten objects in uh, in pandas this is this is a string that's what that means um, so austin why do you need a column at all if, if you're you have to convert all the rows anyway. It's just just the syntax. So if you just do year, instead so, of <laughs> yes, you are. That is a great question. This this would do the exact same thing as this line of code. Um, I just wanted to show, and I, I should have commented that out. Um, these two things do the exact same thing, um, but this is another way of doing the exact same thing. Um, which sometimes, let's say you wanted to, you know, apply a, a scalar value to a bunch of different columns. Um, I guess that's not a great example. I just wanted to show that you could do this more than one way. Okay. So, right, well, I'll show you again that that does the exact same thing. So now that we have the, the year column as a string, we want to actually append the actual you know, estimate date to it so then we can get you know, a better representation for, for what we know about the data. Um, so as we remember back up here, each of these start um, in uh, July 1st of each year. So, Let's just append July 1st plus the year because just like with strings, we can use, we can add strings and then they just get pasted next to each other. Um, we can do that with pandas too. Um, and great, now we have a column that looks more familiar to us. This, this has meaning now, it has more meaning at least. So, the, the last two things that I want to show you in this section is what if I want to rename a column to maybe a more appropriate name like date? Um, and then also, what about if a, the string July 1st of 2010, you, it's a string, it could have more meaning if it were a date. I can't really, sub, I cannot subtract, you know, July 1st of 2014 from July 1st of 2010. Um, it's going to say, you can't do that. Um, so let's also look at how to convert a date format or a string into a date. 
uh, pandas makes that really easy. And this is, this is something that I, I won't be able to touch on in this presentation, but I've linked a ton of supplementary material for dealing with time series data. Um, and that's pandas, pandas does some crazy stuff with time series. Um, and, and using what I'm about to show you is going to, uh, is really gonna come in handy when you need to convert a, a column of strings to, to dates. Um, so as we see here, um, let's go back. We want to rename the, the column that was year to, to date. So to do that, we just use rename. Um, and, and here you, you do have to specify that it's a column because as we know, there are other things inside of this data frame. There's also index. Um, the index, or there, there are other uh, elements inside of the data frame that you can rename. So you have to say, I want to, I want to rename columns, and I think it's helpful to think of it as I want to rename this old column name to this new column name, and that's exactly what we did. Um, so lastly, in this uh, in this portion of the presentation, what we're going to do is is convert strings to dates. So we have our, our strings that are dates and what we'll do is we'll use this really convenient function in pandas called to date time. Um, and you can pass it a, a series, um, a column of, um, of dates as strings and it's gonna convert those to, to date time, which is fantastic. In, in no time, you've gone to something that has so much more meaning. Um, and this, this line of code right here is if you do time series analysis, you're going to write this a thousand times. It is, I use this thing all the time. Um, it's, it's great to convert between strings to dates. Um, and it's really flexible. You can give it a ton of different formats of dates. And it's, it's pretty good at figuring out what kind of, uh, of format you gave it. So if you said October 5th of 2020, it would probably be able to, to figure out, okay, you gave me the literal month name, the day and the year, and, and put it in the right format. So this is, this is indispensable, this is an awesome function. So another thing that Pandas is, is fantastic um, and doing, and we, we briefly showed off in the, the first example was quickly breaking down and describing a data set. Um, there's actually this built-in function called describe, and this is a whole data frame. Notice we didn't specify any, um, any columns here. Pandas was smart enough to go in and say, you know, I see that these other columns are strings, we can't do descriptive statistics on strings. So it just grabbed out the numeric columns and you get things like the mean, the standard deviation, the min, all this stuff for free in one line of code. Um, you can really start to quickly understand the data set that you have um, using a function like this. So in, in this next uh, code line, let's say that we want to get the population of Alabama in 2010, um, and, and our data set is counties, right? So how are we gonna get for the whole state of Alabama, Austin? That's, that's strange. Um, well, if we remember in the metadata, it said that years, the year equals to one was the 2010 census population value. So like we learned before, let's just filter out and get just the rows that are where year equals one. And then let's, from, from that filtered data set, let's then just select out the population estimate series or the, the column, and then just apply dot sum. Just like that, this is the, the population of Alabama from the 2010 census. That's awesome. We just broke down, we filtered, we grabbed out a piece of our data and applied a function to the whole data set and a line of code. That's powerful. A different way of doing that, let's say you want to get, you know, different 
um, different statistics more than just the sum or just the mean. Um, you could also use this dot ag, which is aggregate, dot aggregate. Um, and you, you pass in a, a dictionary here, and the dictionary is the, the column name, and you can specify more than one column name. If we wanted to, you could just pass in, you know, other, other column names after this, and then specify what metrics you want pandas to compute for you. So you are saying, I want to get the sum, I want to get the mean, and I want to get the median for, for the population of, uh, or for the series um, for, this, for this filtered subset. All right, this, this doesn't have that much meaning in, in this example, but I, I really just hope to show you that this is, this is powerful. Um, this is a really quick way to break down data sets, um, and that's, that's great. Something that I showed in the very first example was, was group by, um, and group by is something that we're not really gonna touch on today, um, but um, I just wanna give you a taste of it. I'm not really gonna explain it a ton, um, but what we're saying here is from our big data frame, the one that we got from, um, from the census that just has like five columns in it, um, we want to, to group by um, the column year. So for example, every, every uh, row that equals one will all be grouped together. Every row that equals two, those, those uh, computations will all be grouped together. Um, and I'm just going to take out the population estimate column, and then I want you to sum it. So we're going to be able to get a sum within each of those groups. I wholeheartedly don't expect you to understand all that's going on right here. But just to, just to see how quickly we can break down um, the margins within a data set, that's, that's awesome. Just, just gaze at how we've grown, literally. Um, so a, lo a lot of us that are graduate students or, um, heck, if you're an undergrad, you might be doing correlation as well. Um, and doing some, some more statistics. Um, I, I wanted to show you that you can also do a really quick um, Pearson's R correlation matrix. Um, so we're gonna, we're gonna pull in this iris data set and we'll use this later in the plotting section. Um, but you just use this dot core um, for correlation. You can also you know, specify if you wanted to do a different kind of correlation, there, there's an argument for that. Um, but as you can see, we can see really quickly petal length and petal width have a really high um, correlation and correlation being the relationship um, direction and, um, and the magnitude of that relationship. So what if you want to do R squared? Cool. Let's just multiply. Let's just square all of our values in our correlation matrix. Now we got our R squared for all of the columns and all the columns and rows um, in our correlation matrix. And that's just awesome. Um, just screenshot this, send it to your advisor and grin. Um, this is, it just makes it trivial and that's awesome. I know that we're, we're growing thin on time, um, but I promise to, to do my due diligence and not rush through some of this stuff. Um, and just give you what I think is going to be most beneficial to you. So in this next section, we're going to learn how to combine data from multiple data frames. So let's say um, you have a bunch of CSV files in a folder. Um, you could read them all into a list um, where each element in that list is a data frame. Um, we're going to, I'm going to show you how, if you wanted to, to merge all of those um, all of those new data frames into a single data frame. That's what we're going to do in this um, in this section. So just uh, just for fun, let's say we want to make a data set that is just Shelby County and um, and Tuscaloosa County. So we're just going to print both of those just to see what our data looks like quickly. Um, and you'll see right Tuscaloosa County. We've been playing with this one a lot. Notice here. 
that these two data frames do not have the same number of rows and columns, or they have different number of columns. There's an additional column percent female in the Tuscaloosa data frame that's not here in Shelby data frame. Um, I want to show you how, how cool it is that we, Panda doesn't care. Um, it's not going to throw an error that you didn't, that you didn't, you know, remove this column or do something with this column. It's just going to say, all right, we didn't have values for, for all of those rows. So just make them not a number. We don't, we don't know what they are. Um, so this, this, this language here concatenate, um, is something that you'll see a lot in, in it's used a lot in computers. Um, it's maybe not something that we use a lot in English, and I totally get that. Um, concatenate, just think of this as concatenate just means to glue things together long-wise. So if you had um, a sheet of paper up here and a sheet of paper down here, you glued them, you glued the bottom of the paper to the top of the other paper. That's all that concatenate means. So this pd.concatenate or concat function just takes in a list of data frames. So again, if you had read in a list of files from a folder, you could just put that list right here and it's gonna give you a data frame um, with all of those data frames that were in the list concatenated or joined lengthwise together. That's awesome. Um, well, what if you have data frames that you know, share some relationship? They have, um, think of like in, um, in GIS, if you have two different shape files and one of them um, has one column, or they both share a, a column together, but maybe they have different columns as well. Um, so in this example, these two data frames are going to share the A column, they're the exact same. Um, but then they have different, they have other columns as well. So let's take a look just to see, see what those two things look like. Well, we can, instead of like concat allowed us to do glue them long wise, um, we can instead glue them next to each other using pd.merge. Um, and merge, I would, I would advise you guys go check it out more. Um, it, you can do a ton of all, all the commands that you learned in intro to GIS about, um, about joins, one to many joins, many to one joins. You can do all of that stuff here, a left join, a right join, an inner and outer, all that stuff is here and it's so easy. Um, so again, here we're just passing in our, our AB data frame, this one, and our AC data frame, that one. And we're just saying join on A. Um, and as you see, we just get back a data frame. And that, that's great. This is a way to take you know, data that might share some relationship and, and glue it together to, to you know, merge more data together. And that's, that's awesome. So the last thing I want to show you guys, other than helpful resources, is, is plotting. Um, plotting with Seaborn. Seaborn is another package. Um, that is, it's not included with pandas. Um, in Google Colab, it does come pre-installed, um, but it's, it is the easiest um, plotting library that I've found to date in Python. And you can make some really beautiful plots. Um, since we don't have a, a ton of time, I'll highlight a few of these that I think are really cool. But um, just to point out, there's of the plots that I'm going to show you, only one of them takes more than one line of code. If that's not beautiful, I don't know what is. Um, so Seaborn is, um, if we look at this picture up here, why, why I included it, is this is kind of how um, Seaborn kind of groups different types of plots together, different families of plots. So if you want a, a relationship plot, you know, the relationship between some, something on the y-axis and the x-axis, you can use the kind of plot of, of scatter or a, a line plot. Um, likewise, if you're interested in, you know, what distribution the data follows, you can use this disk plot. And right, you see histograms, um, a kernel density estimation plot, an empirical uh, cumulative density function plot, and a rug plot. 
I'm not going to show all of them. Um, and there, there, is a, there are more plots that are not included in this image, namely regression plots that I will show here in a second that are, this is just fantastic. We've already shown how to get your data into pandas and play around with it, adjust it, make it something more usable by yourself. Um, well, what about plotting it? What about you know visualizing your data, looking at those relationships? Um, Seaborn lets us do that really, really easily. So the last thing I want to harp on, I know I talked about this, this image up here, um, that these are different families, and then Seaborn uses this kind. So the kind of plot is a scatter plot, or the kind is a line plot. So you would say a relationship plot with a kind scatter. Um, so I'll show that here just to, just to demonstrate. Um, so again, this is the same iris data set. This is super common, uh, really commonly used in plotting libraries. Uh, if you've ever used R and ggplot, this is a, I think this is the exact data set they use to, to show off their visuals. Um, so just for, just for that sake, we'll use it as well. So we're, we're reading it in, um, I found it just online and we will read it into a data frame. And this is what it looks like. This is what the first five rows look like. So what about if we want to make a, a scatter plot? So we can say we want a relationship plot um, and we want to see the relationship between the sepal length and the sepal width. Um, Great, that was really easy. One line of code, one line of code. What about a regression plot? Let's see the linear regression between the, uh, the width and the pedal length. Um, and as you see, uh, it might be kind of hard to see, there are actually confidence intervals here that, uh, that Seaborn computes for you already. Um, this is great just to really quickly check out the relationships in your data. What about a distribution plot? If we want to get a histogram of the pedal length. All right, great. That was really easy. We used this plot. Um, by, by default, the disk plot is a histogram. Um, but in the next example, like we said before, if you specify the kind, what if you want a kernel density estimation plot instead? So instead of putting them in bins, it's going to estimate what the actual underlying uh, kernel density function is that, that the data follows. So you know what? What if we want both of them? Boom. We can just say KDE equals true. That's great. We can look at the histogram bins. We can adjust the bin widths if we want to, and then also look at the, the estimated kernel density. Now, now is the, this, is, this is the plot that I don't think that you guys were ready for. I know that I wasn't. So the next one is a pair plot. Um, and this is going to show the relationship between, um, between values in our data set. Um, so what if we wanted to look at the relationship between the, the sepal length and the sepal width? Pair plot, it does that. Now, what's even cooler here, the really big take home, is we can specify a hue. Uh, if you're not familiar, hue is a synonym of, of color. Um, and this is going to split out based on the variety. So there are three different varieties of flowers in our data set. It's going to split those out and just plot the relationship between in, in those three different categories. And on, on the center divide we see, or the center diagonal, sorry, there is a, a, a kernel density estimation function there. This is awesome. We just, we made a beautiful plot in a line of code. Um, this, is, this is the only plot that I've, that has more than one line of code, but this is just to show um, kind of the, uh, a different version of the pair plot. But what if we wanted to, um, we again use the hue to, to distinguish the different kinds of flowers, but then we're saying these upper plots up here, we want to make those a residual plot, so the residuals of a linear regression. 
And then the lower, we want to make these a regression plot, so a linear regression, and we turn off the confidence intervals. Um, and then the diagonal, let's make a histogram plot with the kernel density over it. And then let's just add the legend. So in five lines of code, you have a, a near publication ready plot. If that's not beautiful, I'm here for the wrong reason. That's fantastic. That's awesome. So we'll check out a different version uh, or a different plot, a joint plot. Um, so a joint plot lets you look at the, the scatter plot, but then on the sides, you can look at the distribution of data. So that's just, that's fantastic. That's, it's so nice to be able to quickly break down your data, make some really cool plots, visualize your data to better understand it. Um, the ones that I kind of neglected to look at were the category plots. So in here, we're looking at the different categories and then their, their petal lengths, um, as well as we can, we can use a box plot instead. So I hope to have shown you that, that Seaborn makes it trivial to make beautiful plots. Um, and and that's, that's awesome. That's a huge takeaway. I know that I am just... Um, just reaching over the hour and a half mark, but I just want to leave you with these helpful resources. Um, one thing that I, I really hope that you guys do is go check out um, this tutorial on time series. If you do time series stuff, this is one thing I really wanted to push or really wanted to cover in this, but we just didn't have enough time. Um, I think that you have the foundation to, to learn this stuff quickly. And this is, this is the best tutorial that I've found to date to learn it quickly. Um, I'll let you read through these helpful resources as um, on your own time, but I will mention four quick packages. Um, GeoPandas lets you, um, lets you uh, import or ingest geospatial data as a pandas data frame. So you can do tons of stuff like you would typically do in GIS. So get the intersection, the union, a dissolve a, um, a, a shape file, whatever, it's in GeoPandas. And you get all of the same great things that I've shown above with pandas, but then also you add in that geospatial functionality. There's also some great mapping to do. Um, this one has saved me a ton of time. Um, if you do anything with meteorological data or hydrological data, um, namely if you use either of these two formats, this is a grid package that lets you um, transform those really difficult and awful formats to handle um, into a pandas data frame and where it's so much easier and it's hopefully growing to be more cozy for you to use. Um, Stats models is one of the oldest and tried and true and vetted statistical packages in Python. It integrates really well with pandas. Um, you can do anything from um, OLS regression to there's stuff like um, ARMA models or ARIMA models or way more complicated forecasting models. Um, all there and it's super easy to use. There's tons of examples that make it easy for you to take a, a few hours and learn how to use them. And that's, that's awesome. Oh, yikes, that's scary. Um, and then for, for my hydro homies out there, I'll mention um, the data retrieval package that the USGS has. Um, if you work with water data, it's a must have. It makes getting um, water data from the USGS trivial. It actually imports the data as a pandas data frame and you can immediately start playing with it. Um, so that, that's, that, that's all my parting words. I'll cut, cut through most of it. And I will say, um, that, that keep creating and, and stay curious. Um, thanks so much for your time. And if we have any time for questions, I'd be happy to answer any. <laughs> Thank you, Austin. That, that was really great. Any questions? Anyone online? Do you have any questions? No, but thank you, Austin. That was a great presentation. I learned a lot. Yep. Great, thanks. Yeah, and just to, you know, I'll, I'll give you some. I've been using, started using Pandas quite recently. And um, and, and it's, a, it's a, you know, Austin gave us a really good start 
uh, which I, I wish I had when I started uh, using it because it is a learning, a pretty steep learning curve and most of it is just you saw the syntax itself is kind of confusing. You have parentheses and you have brackets and squirrely brackets here. It's, it's kind of hard to know. Um, and my experience has been, it's kind of need, you just need patience and kind of in sometimes brute force to just try and try and try and go online and try and try and try. But once you get the hang of it, and again, Austin did a great job at, at introducing it, it can really save you, uh, first of all, enable you to do a lot of stuff, but also save you a lot of uh, hardship in, in, in handling those, especially the large data sets on, in Python. So it's worth the, the investment in learning how to use it, even though, as I said, it, it is, it's not easy at first. Yeah, no, I, I completely concur with that. And while, while you're on that point, I, I didn't mention these helpful resources. Like Dr. Cohen said, there are a few different, this is the Pandas, um, their actual website. If you go to their user guide, this one, this one's really hard. There's so much information here. Um, this, this is how to get confused, how to not want to use pandas. I've linked one that is, I think is so much easier to use. Um, if you go to the home page, if you forget about the link, it's the getting started guide. Um, I actually stole some of their graphics, but this is, they, they really outline, um, really briefly how to, how to get started with pandas. Um, and, and the, the time series tutorial that I mentioned is actually this one. So they, they give you data that you can play with and you can follow along with code and learn right there. And I think this is this is the way to learn pandas. There is a hard way for sure. I definitely agree with Dr. Cohen on that. All righty, any questions? Okay, so Austin, thank you so much. And all those that join us uh, online and uh, you guys, I'll see you next week. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. See you later.